according to Matthew. John the Baptist appeared preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. They acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry the sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, we continue to progress during this Advent time. The second Advent candle has been lit, and last weekend I preach about how Advent is really the forgotten liturgical season. I mentioned that we certainly celebrate Christmas. We only have to go out those doors, and you know it's Christmas for the world. Turn on the radio, it's Christmas. Everything is Christmas, lights, and of course we as Catholic Christians lend, perhaps it is the most traditional of the liturgical seasons, because as Catholics we've learned to endure the disciplines of Lent, we have special celebrations during Lent, we give up something for Lent, so you have a lot of that that is uh, part of the culture as well, and of course Easter, Everybody dresses up, you wear the nicest hat, and you get into the spirit of Easter. But Advent, what's Advent all about? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure even if you go outside and you say, we're celebrating Advent, people are going to say, what's that? <laughs> they don't know. They have no idea what Advent is all about. But one of the beauties of our church is that we should be liturgical people. We follow the liturgy. The liturgy gives us a theme, gives us reading from scripture that are helpful to us. And, and in a way, every Advent is a little different because there's something that we get, something that we learn. And even after 35 plus years as a priest, I guarantee you, every Advent, there's something new, something that I discovered. One thing that I discovered this year is that the desert is a very special place liturgically. Of course, uh, during Lent, 
we hear about the desert, that's the first Sunday of Lent. We go with Jesus into the desert that gives meaning to the 40 days of Lent. But it, it dawned on me this year that the desert is also very important during Advent. Actually today, as we are introduced to the figure of John the Baptist, it is said from the beginning, John the Baptist appeared in the desert. And then we have the evangelist Matthew saying to us, that's who Isaiah prophesied. He said, a voice that cries in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. So you begin to at least hear two allusions, two mentions of the desert. And I was thinking to myself, that should be a good image for us to live at. And it helped me because I've been to the desert. I've lived in the desert. Not figuratively, but literally, because as a Navy chaplain, I've spent many, many months at the Mojave Desert in California, 29 Palms. And also I lived for a whole year in the Iraq Desert with the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Marines, as I was their chaplain. We spent the whole year there in the desert. And I reflected, I began to think, what did the desert teach me? Some of the lessons from the desert, uh, as I reflected this week on the readings and about that imagery of the desert. And there were three things that came immediately to mind. The first thing was that as we arrived in Iraq, the unit that had been there before us, they had all the trap right next to the chow hall, to where you eat. So as we began to minister there, and as the Marines and the sailors that were with us, we would go to eat. You had to eat with the flies. There were lots of flies. And I'm not talking about, we all have that experience. You know, we go to a restaurant, you sit outside, there's a fly bothering you. Sometimes even they sneak into our homes and you have to swat that fly. I'm not talking about that. I mean, you had hundreds of flies. You had to learn how to eat with the flies. <laughs> there was no way you were going to get rid of them. So you had to eat fast. That was kind of like what we did in the beginning, but then we realized that we shouldn't endure this. So quickly we realized the desert is a very spacious place, and we could take all the trash way out there, far from the dining room. And actually, we even made a sign that said, no fly zone. Huh. We got rid of the flies, so they were gone. And you could eat in peace with no flies around you. Thankfully, because the desert is spacious. You have a lot of space. Second method, extreme weather. When you spend in those areas of the desert, people think that the desert is a very hot place. That is not actually true. The desert is very hot during the day, but the temperatures vary so much at night. That's why very few vegetation can grow there. So that's the reason for the desertic place, the extreme weather. And, and we endure the rainy season, the cooler season, and then of course the summer, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty tough. People say, how does that feel? I tell them, just turn on your oven, put it to 350, and let it heat up, and then open the door. And feel that air coming at you from the oven. That's how it feels there all day long. So you're just getting that kind of air, and you have to learn how to deal with extreme weather. The water doesn't cool down. You have to learn how to drink hot water. It feels like medicine. But you have to drink it because dehydration is a big problem. So you have to drink it no matter what the temperature is. And you begin to realize you have to withstand and learn how to live in extreme weather. Third image. We had like the Porta Johns way out, spacious desert. And I remember one of the great things about the desert is that 
There are no obstacles, no obstruction to what you can see. You can see all the way to the horizon. And I remember being there like in the Port of John in the morning and, and you can see the little foxes walking around with their little uh, cubs and little uh, babies. And, and I remember thinking, I hope that fox doesn't get any closer to me <laughs> because you never knew what they were going to do. But you had no obstacles. You could, you could perfectly see everything. It's easy to see in the desert. No obstacles to your vision. And, and I think that's a great image for Advent, that those three experiences can help us very much. First of all, because Advent is a call to make space. The spaciousness of the desert is a reminder that we need to make space for God. We need to give God time. You know, I think it's very easy to spot evil in the world. There's a lot of evil everywhere. We see it. We, we, we live in it. We, we fear and, and, and we experience that. But with God, it takes a little effort on our part. It's not like you sit there and God is going to just reveal himself to you. It's worth working for. It's worth sacrificing ourselves for. It's worth, worth spending time with him. And the desert is a reminder that we need to make space for God. That's what we call a plan of life. Whatever you do daily to be in contact and connection with God, that's very important. And Advent is a call to that. And the desert is a good reminder that there should be space. We live in a world where we're being bombarded by things. You know, I have a work email. I have an archdiocesan email. I have a university email. I have a personal email. You get bombarded by things every day. I call it the tyranny of emails because, you know, the protocol of emails is you shouldn't wait a week to answer an email. You should answer it quickly. So you have to be attentive to the emails. And, and even the news, you know, when we get through the phone, it used to be that you would hear what happened yesterday or last week. Now, when you get something on your phone, it just happened. It was a minute ago. <laughs> and, and we're living under that constant bombardment that we think we have to take care of, and we don't make space for God. We need to make space for God. And whatever that is for you and for me, we need to take time to be with God. Sometimes we can shut down the world a little bit and to say, you know, we're going to spend some time, quality time, with God. Second thing is that we need to get used to extreme temperatures. And I'm not talking about global warming. I'm talking about the fact that we live in a world of extreme temperatures. There's a lot of things coming at us. And, and as Catholic Christians, we have a belief. We believe in certain things. But if we are honest and if we're truthful, that's not where the world is. There are a lot of turmoil out there in connection to the moral teaching of the church, what we we're called to do, how we're called to live. If you read the catechism, and you read the catechism out there, some people are going to laugh at you. I don't know if you have experienced that, but in the world we live in, if you say the things you believe to some people, they're not going to want to be with you anymore. They're going to tell you, no, I'm done with that, but let's... Uh, Let's just break apart. We cannot handle that because I don't believe like that. You will get some rejection from standing for something. John the Baptist, in the desert, it cost him his head standing up for something. So we live in a world of extreme temperature. I was reading a news yesterday. I think it was from Belgium. In Belgium, they're getting thousands of people calling churches, Catholic churches, saying that they want to be baptized. They want to be scratched out of their books. Of course, the church has to say that that cannot happen because we believe that baptism gives us an indelible sign. So you cannot be unbaptized, but they are writing next to the record of that person asked to be baptized. And that's thousands of people that are asking for that. We live in a world of extreme temperatures. People are reacting in extreme ways. And there we are, and we stand for something, and we need to learn how to deal with extreme temperatures. Part of that then, is to be able to share our faith, to talk about our faith, to say that we believe in something. And that's very hard 
Because at times when we do that, we're going to feel the rejection, and that's never easy. Nobody wants to be rejected. And yet, we do believe you're here, obviously, for a reason. So do people know what you stand for? Do people know that at 9.30, December 4th, you're at Max? Probably a lot of people that you know don't even know that you're here. Well, we need to witness to the faith because people don't hear that message. And thirdly, that's kind of like the global understanding that we live in a world of extreme temperatures, but there are also personal obstacles. And the desert is a place that we have great vision. We can see. We can see all the way to the horizon. There are no obstacles. And yet we know that in our lives, we have obstacles. Actually, maybe a few, but there are things that are always causing us, uh, causing us problems. I, I know a lot of people that have stopped going to confession, for example. They don't go to confession anymore. And I hear them say, Father, I don't want to go to confession because I always confess the same thing. Hey, give thanks to God that at least you know what's your main obstacle, what's your main problem, what is it that you're dealing with. St. Augustine, I think it was the one who said, that if we could get rid of one vice every year, we would be saints. Think about that. That means that, you know, we don't get rid of things immediately. That's not an overnight thing. We need to battle them. We need to fight them because we want clear vision. We want no obstacle. Not only in general, because it's a tough world, but personally. What is it that I'm dealing with? What is it that I have to fight the most with? And, and with that imagery of the desert, hopefully as we go out today from this Mass, we kind of resist the temptation to skip this holy season. That we can truly be liturgical people. That we can really follow what the church is doing and challenging us to do. It's very hard because I know, you know, the moment you turn on the radio going home, what do you hear? I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, right? And it's immediately, there we are. And, and we're in action. And we're in the desert. And we need to make space for God. And we need to learn how to live in extreme temperatures. And we need to get rid of obstacles that do not allow us to have a clear vision. So today, we ask John the Baptist, who appeared in the desert, that we may truly heed his voice, prepare the way of the Lord. Amen.